Hello, welcome to a new year and a new show. This is Paranormal Peep Show with myself, Neil Geddes Ward, and Andrew Chaplin. Hi, Andy, uh, how are you? Hi, guys, how are you all doing? I hope you had a good new year. Well, it, I have. How was yours? Um, a bit boring, to be honest. Um, just kind of like family do's, getting drunk, nothing match- <laughs> particularly spectacular. What about you guys? A typical Christmas for me. Typical Christmas. Um, I don't get drunk. I don't drink. So I've I've always never got a hangover to look forward to, which is actually good from my point of view. So I'll just explain to listeners, this is the Paranormal Peep Show. This is the first of its kind for 2017. And Andy and I have been co-hosts on the Paranormal UK radio show with Irene and Mark. And uh, we still help out occasionally on that Monday uh, show or well it goes out on Wednesdays I believe but we, we kind of record the show on a Monday and um, we've been asked ourselves to actually co-host this new show and so we've called it the Paranormal Peep Show because we believe we're just dipping our fingers or toes or ears and eyes into the world of the paranormal because it's such a vast subject we can't possibly go into massive detail throughout everything um, we're literally just taking a peek at what we can get our hands on would you agree with that Andy? Yeah definitely I mean um the the idea of paranormal um, peep show obviously it's a bit saucy and a bit naughty and it's kind of like us it's a bit mischievous um we do obviously respect our topics but um we don't like to make things too serious we like a little bit of a a dash of humor here and there well that's right i mean we do have uh, i mean we're hoping to get a guest on like erica bore in 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 the sort of future Um, oh god not him no don't be maybe eric might like to make a quick appearance now no, no. It's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think I think the best thing to do is keep him locked in his box. Where he's locked in his locked. box, then. Okay, for, for maybe for those special occasions, perhaps. Special occasions. All right. <laughs> Only when we get drunk. <laughs> yeah, drunk. Okay. All right. Well, we're, we're pressed on with tonight's show. Now we're, we're going to hopefully cover lots of topics covering from uh, a whole range of things of the paranormal, and obviously the paranormal is, is a very, very vast subject, and you can cover anything from ghosts, fairies, spirits, uh, strange beasts like sasquatches. Um, uh, visitations, time travel, you know, you name it. And one of the very, very popular and certainly subjects I'm interested in and Andy is interested in is that of the UFO phenomena. And so tonight we're very pleased to welcome Dave Hodrian and Philip Kinsella, uh, both people that I've met and worked with in the past at various places. Uh, Philip, I've worked with um, filming in the past at uh, Rendlesham Forest. He kindly took us around there a few years ago and uh, Philip is also uh, a very talented medium himself and Dave Hodrian we can welcome from Birmingham and he runs the Birmingham UFO investigations group uh, up in Birmingham and so welcome to the show gentlemen Philip and Dave. Thank you very much. Thank Good you very much. Here. Thank you. Hi guys nice to meet you. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, Philip, Hi Andrew so, yes nice to meet you. <laughs> Philip if we could start with you um, your obviously a talented medium uh, and, and you do your work with the spirit world and uh, you've also got an interest in ufos um how did you sort of move from the spirit world into the world of ufos has it always been run on a sort of uh, sort of a, a dual basis the the idea of, of ufos has always interested me um, after i had the sighting when i was young and the, the spiritual aspect came in much later in, in my life, my late 30s. And, and I, think, I think and I feel that both aspects of the phenomena are somehow linked um, to some degree. Um, and it's taken me a very long time to try and get away from the nuts and bolts aspects of ufology, which it certainly appeared to be back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and indeed the 60s. And uh, it's moved into a new paradigm now as we call modern times so my interest in the ufos has always been there and it still is to this present day the psychic element uh, was something i was very fascinated with i wanted to i wanted to see if there was any truth in this in the proof of survival or after death uh, encounters that people have with loved ones and i to explore that because of much more than just flesh and blood biological machines that have an expiry date on them. And you've had uh, sightings yourself, haven't you, over the last few years? <laughs> yes, I have. I mean, we had the the one that was uh, uh, the one that happened uh, most recently was on the 9th of April at uh, roughly quarter past eleven at night, and that was three massive orbs. And uh, my my niece Charlie also had observed them. 
um, as well. So it's, it's really weird that they people like us, we, we, we seem to be, we're not special in any way, but we seem to draw them or they seem to be like magnets. But no matter how much we try to understand them, they're, they're, they're always further away. You, I don't feel that we have the uh, conscious ability in this form to fully appreciate what's exactly going on. Um, with regards to it, but that that was on, on on the 9th of April of this year that we saw three of them, and we thought that it would make headline news um, locally here. But uh, not, um, even though other people have reported seeing them, um, but nothing came about at all. I, th I think you mean last year, don't you? Because <laughs> we're yeah, in the yes. year, of course. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, we are in 2017. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I am way behind. I, I keep thinking we're still in 2016, but that was 2016, April yeah. of 2016. That's, that's definitely a case of missing time there. <laughs> <That's> time travel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was on the on the 9th of April, 2016, at quarter past 11 at night. That, and that, that's, that was, would be in the Bedfordshire area, is that correct? That's, cor that's correct, Bedfordshire, yeah. And, and then, but... Back in 1998, you also had a, a quite a, an interesting experience with your oh, brother Ronald yes. and a friend of yours in, in Rendlesham Forest, of all places. Yes, that's right. We were researching Rendlesham Forest, and um, we'd done a lot of experiments after meeting Larry Warren and Peter Robbins, who, of course, are the co-authors to Left at Eastgate that came back uh, that came out many years ago. And uh, and Peter Robbins suggested uh, at a UFO um, group that I attended that we go to Rendlesham to check it out because there was a lot of strange things still happening there. Um, because we were under the impression that, you know, the, 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 the only thing that happened there was the 1980 event with the uh, military, U.S. military. However, um, on making our exploits into the forest, we discovered there were a lot of strange things. And we had actually witnessed um, a triangular shaped UFO, a massive craft with a circular undercarriage that occurred back in 1998, uh, June of 1998. And, and that was an incredibly amazing um, and we recorded all of this and sent the information off to uh, UFO magazines. But again, we, we got little in the way of understanding back from um, other people within the media. Not that we wanted the attention or sensational seekers. We were more interested in bringing the truth to the public, but no one wanted to know about it. So I had to write about it and bring it out that way. And of course, you yourself did a small documentary on it. Remember, you did one that mm -hmm. about that. Um, so that was, and that, that was an experiment that we performed that... I mean, it will take too long to explain on your show, but it had a lot to do with um, consciousness and about exploring consciousness. And I think when you go back, maybe my exploration to the UFO phenomena and of the psychic realm uh, is somehow trying to bridge the gap between that uh, conscious level or the extended extendedness of consciousness beyond this physical realm, as it were. So, yes, we tried to communicate with them. We, we did that. Um, and um, before we, we did the whole thing as an experiment to see if we could bring a craft towards us and that's exactly what happened but that was all detailed in, in my book Believe um, Bridging the Gap Between the Psychic and UFO Phenomena and of course Sky Crash that the publishers brought out um, Sky Crash Throughout Time which was an extended version of the UFO scene around Rendlesham and that was co-authored with Brenda Butler the original investigator into the case And so that was witnessed by yourself your yeah, twin my twin brother, brother and Susan. Yeah, Susan yeah, as well. Susan, we, your friend. Okay. Our little gang, our little little uh, little small gang of explorers. So, um, and that was incredible. And, and there and were you, many other. Where you we ran were. under the UFO. Is that correct? Ran, uh, ran towards it. Ran, you ran towards yeah, it. Yeah, ran towards it. In, and I remember your description. You said that you fell over. The, it was wet or something <laughs> in the grass or something. And uh, I took a mouthful of dirt as I fell because it went out like a lot. It just switched off. I mean, basically, um, when the craft appeared um, above some trees um, across the farmer's field that I explained about, and half the farmer's field was uh, covered in, in uh, dirt and the other half was all crop. And when this machine appeared at quarter past uh, ten at night, um, and uh, it just suddenly appeared like a, a bolt out of the blue and it made no sound and it was triangular in construction and the upper part was triangular and there was a, a gap and a, a circular appendage underneath and uh, as I explained, uh, one half was moving one way in a clockwise and anti-clockwise motion, if you mm -hmm. see what I mean. They, they were joined but they were separated uh, and uh, one was moving one way or the other and all these lights were coming from it and I started to run towards it and I felt like a half-crazed hominid um, because all I wanted to do was get to it, because I wanted the truth. Mm. Um, and we didn't take any cameras. We, didn't, we, we made a pact with them mentally or through telepathy that we didn't want any. We're not sensational seekers. We just wanted to see them. 
uh, and and then I started running towards it when it appeared. I mean, that, that's half of the story. There's a lot more towards it that ties it all together. But as I said, that's that's a long explanation of, of how we came to that point. But we didn't see any greys. We didn't see any aliens. It was just the object. And as I said, when I got underneath it, it, it and I tripped and fell because I was running so fast, um, it just disappeared. Um, and, and that was my take on it. But what's interesting is that I, I've learned a lot more. Or I, I hope that I have understood a lot more about the parallels between our connection with we call them and them through us. So um, I'm still working on that that um, theory with regards to our conscious connection with them. So that that was uh, that was many years ago. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Andy, you've obviously got a, a, a mediumistic background similar to myself and Philip. Mm. Um, You've obviously got a, an interest in UFOs as well, because we always bump into each other at the UFO uh, Academy in Watford. Yeah. Um, how did your interest come about? Um, well, before I get onto that, I'll, I'll actually say that I'm um, talking of bumping into people. I'm actually, I've actually seen Philip um, a couple of his talks when he did them in where was it, Leighton Buzzard or Milton Keynes? Um, do you remember the ones, um, Philip? Um, one of those, yes. I, it I was. Think it was like was. a Royal, Royal um, British Legion type place. I think it was. Um, I think it was Leighton uh, Buzzard. Oh, uh, yeah. But you probably do quite a few. So I can't, can't remember, yes. I, you I probably do quite know. a few. And, yeah, I found no, that no, really, really, really interesting. Um, and for anyone who's not um, seen Philip talk, um, definitely do go and um, go and see it. Because, um, Philip, you bring together the worlds of kind of like the spirit and, and the ET element and how they might kind of, um, and, and what I've also been kind of like considering as well, how they might be coming from maybe a similar place or there might be um, similarities whereas in the past traditionally it's been very much a case of ghosts are over here and kind of like ufos are over there and, and never the twain shall meet and but i think um human consciousness within this kind of both fields are beginning to realize there may be a connection like interdimensionally um between the two so andy how did you yes, get, get your interest in 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 the ufo field what was it did oh, okay, one? yeah, I'm going for me specifically, I think it's just been like, um, I think it's just been like on the back burner. I mean, I've always been interested in the ghosts and the paranormal, um, and I have had kind of like experiences there. I can't say, I don't think I've had any UFO experiences, although there was the weird dream state type thing and seeing the trolls and get a feeling, <laughs> feeling of kind of being lifted um, through a window, but I don't know if that was hallucinations or whether that was in an ET direction, who knows. Um, but I, I, I don't remember seeing a UFO as such, like, like Philip. And I don't know about Dave. Um, Dave, have you seen um, have, a UFO yourself? I have, yeah. Um, my most impressive sighting, uh, and nothing like as impressive as some of the things Philip's been talking about seeing, but uh, I, I did see a uh, UFO back in the summer of 2009 uh, in uh, Warminster, of all places, uh, down in Wiltshire, um, which is uh, known as, uh, as a UFO hotspot. Uh, since the late 70s to mid 80s they had a, a massive wave of sightings there um, and things have been seen there ever since uh, I've spoken with a number of other people who've had some very very impressive sightings down in Warminster uh, of clearly something very very unusual um, and it was actually on a UFO Skywatch as part of a um, uh, the uh, weird paranormal conference down in, uh, down in Warminster and uh, we saw a a dark uh, quite large object I would say about the size of a small aircraft um, and it was moving completely silently, uh, moving quite fast, like sort of plane type speed, but absolutely silent. Uh, had a white light on it that would flare up every few seconds, really, really bright. Uh, and the only other light on it was this dark turquoise coloured light, sort of halfway between blue and green. Very strange, not your standard um, lime green. Um, and in the morning, we uh, looked into that. Uh, I got a lot of interviews of other people who were there on the Skywatch. Uh, the case report uh, of that is on the Bufog website. Um, and yeah, it didn't fit with any known uh, military drones or any other lighting of any other known aircraft. So to this day, it's uh, unexplained. Uh, if it was a hoax, it was a very good one. I'll put it as that. Of course, another possibility, Dave, is that we, we, we're unsure, although technically it is a, an unidentified fly, flying object, we're unsure yeah. whether it's an alien object or whether it's like a very advanced military object. Absolutely. Uh, but, but of course, the argument there is if it's kind of like military, why are they showing it to the public or putting it in a place where the public could view it? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, that leads on to kind of an interesting angle of the UFO subject, which is, you know, their origins are some of these things that are seen uh, back engineered or, or possible advanced military craft. And that's entirely possible. But as you say, I've, I've dealt with cases in smack bang in the middle of Birmingham, uh, mm. many, many other cities. There'd be no way that the military would fly these top secret craft that are not widely known about in full sight of people or approach them or even land in front of them. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, do that. And talking of your cases, Dave, um, yes. if you could uh, enlighten us to, as you're the uh, the investigator for the uh, Birmingham UFO group, if you could maybe share a case or two with us. Sure, yeah. Well, uh, one of my specialities, shall we say, with the subject uh, is uh, the abduction phenomena or, or ET contact, uh, as it's uh, referred to. Um, I think it's a, a fascinating aspect of, of ufology, um, and a lot of researchers uh, steer clear of it because there's all sorts of... Uh, very unusual uh, elements and, uh, and angles to it, uh, including the psychic link, um, which uh, Philip uh, has already mentioned. Uh, that's a very key part of it. Um, there's a lot of uh, metaphysical aspects to it, uh, which uh, some people feel it's a bit too way out for them to, to cope with. But I, I think that the contact uh, subject gives us a, a window into what these um, beings uh, are actually up to here, here on the planet. Um, and for that, I find it deeply fascinating. Uh, I've looked into about 250 or so uh, contact cases from all around the world uh, so far. Um, over half of those have been UK-based, of course, uh, being a UK-based uh, UFO group. Um, and, uh, yeah, Kathy's, uh, Kathy's had a number of um, contact experiences throughout her life, um, not just a single incident. Uh, as with uh, many contactees, she's what we uh, refer to as a, a repeater. Uh, which means she's had experiences from childhood onwards. Uh, of, uh, some of those appeared to be uh, linked with other areas of the paranormal um, ghosts or psychic type phenomena, uh, but some very, very definitely linked with, uh, with UFOs. Now, um, yeah, probably one of her most um, powerful and uh, detailed experiences occurred in 1974, and this was when she was uh, 12 years old. Now, there's no, uh, you know, before I tell you about the details, this, I will say there's no physical evidence to back up this uh, but i've spoke with kathy uh, for many many hours about her experiences and i've got absolutely no doubt at all in her in her sincerity um i believe that she's recounting uh, real memories of real incidents that have occurred to her um and you you kind of get that through speaking with people um people give up a, a hell of a lot of their time uh, they're not they're not out for sensationalism they're not out to earn any money off it uh, quite often they are very very scared about getting their personal details out there um, and it's very brave of Kathy to, to even give her, her first name uh, on this uh, a lot of people are not even happy with that um, but yeah when she was uh, 12 years old uh, her and her friend were essentially out just uh, one evening um, ar around uh, Buxton where, where she lives and um, uh, all of a sudden and they they spot essentially a, a silver saucer shaped object above the uh, above the houses alongside the road. It's got a uh, row of lights around the outer rim, and it and it essentially kind of glides glides round in an arc and comes down to rest uh, in the middle of the road uh, in front of them. And there were no uh, there was no traffic around at this time. It was early evening and it was very very quiet. Um, and it, it was essentially ended up hovering about a foot or so off off the ground. Um, she remembers a doorway opening in it and a ramp coming down. So this wasn't really an abduction. Um, she was essentially invited aboard uh, this uh, landed object. Um, she doesn't remember actually treading aboard. She just remembers thinking that she thought somebody was going to come out. Um, her, next, uh, her next recollection was of what she believes took place uh, aboard it. And it was, she said it was very dark. And, um, and she just remembers um, seeing some a kind of stairway and things um there was a there they remember seeing a, a boy so her friend was there too but there was also a young boy and he appeared to be uh, transfixed like he was in a trance he was just standing up and just staring into space um and and then she remembers walking down this corridor so she, she didn't see any beings at that point she just remembers kind of walking and, and realizing that her friend had gone elsewhere um, she remembers seeing a glass uh, cylinder, or looked like glass, uh, and it had in it a pink liquid with uh, what appeared to be a naked uh, human female um, actually floating in this liquid, and she too appeared to be in a kind of sleep-like state. Um, now, I've dealt with other cases where, where very, very similar uh, things have been seen, uh, and there's a couple of cases that I've, uh, I've become aware of uh, where exactly the same thing has been seen with uh, you know, full uh, adult humans uh, 
floating in the in sort of cylinders. Uh, a lot of the time, you find it's uh, a lot younger sort of babies or, or fetuses uh, are seen inside these uh, glass cylinders. That's linking into another angle of the subject, which I can't get into right now because it's, it's it's very detailed. But um, essentially, she then remembers uh, meeting these uh, beings uh, after that and having a, a a conversation with them. Now, at the time, she just remembered them as being very very beautiful. Um, she remembered they were, that that was all she could remember. She she had very few details of what they were actually like. Um, now I've worked with a hypnotic uh, regression therapist on a uh, on a number of these cases, and we regressed uh, Kathy back to this experience, and she um, had sort of further clarity on what these beings actually looked like, um, and what she what she described was these uh, very picturesque looking, uh, very humanoid uh, people uh, with um, sort of shoulder length blonde hair. Uh, they were wearing these kind of uh, light light blue uh, coloured uh, jumpsuits. Now, uh, this description uh, matches many, many other uh, contact cases uh, on record. Um, and these are the, uh, the uh, particular type of being we usually refer to as uh, the Nordics, because uh, they, they look uh, uh, like Nords, um, or just humanoids, or sometimes Pleiadians. Um now she remembers having this conversation with them. And she, uh, there was there was quite a lot of uh, discussion went on between them. Uh, she said it was it was very very positive the experience. Uh, she wasn't scared at all by them. Uh, she actually felt quite comfortable and felt this uh, connection to them, almost like they were her uh, uh, family. Uh, that's how she described it, uh, like talking to her brother. Um, and uh, really, that's that's where it ended. But uh, a, a very very interesting uh, aspect of. Uh, of it is is what happened at the end of this conversation because she she realized that her time with these beings was coming to an end and she didn't want to go she didn't want to uh, leave them and she asked uh, this uh, being uh, you know when will i uh, see you again and will i ever see you again and the, and the being said to her uh, you will see us again but only when you die that was um, that was what it told her and it it didn't say what it meant by that um but we, there's an interesting link there with uh, with the afterlife, um, and this has come up in other cases I've looked into as well from time to time. Mm, that's very interesting because yeah. uh, this is something that I've been discussing with other people, um, particularly over this last year about the kind of the afterlife and the UFO phenomenon. Always in the past have been very separate books on the library shelf, so to speak. And uh, you know, you read one account of the life in the spirit world, and it all sounds fantastic and interesting, and you read the betty and barney hill abduction cases and it seems very very different and and, yes. and i've always wondered about the kind of uh, the connections between uh this world and the next and you know what are the ufos to do with this now now philip you you've kind of bridged that gap yourself in your in your book haven't you yes i i, I came up with a theory or it was uh, I, I i don't know if it was a credit to me i just had a bolt of flash of inspiration in 1996 where i was uh, trying to work out what the greys were because I was specifically more interested in the research of the abduction like day phenomena for personal reasons but um, one of the things that I, I did understand was that uh, made a correlation between the greys in the sense that they are interested in reproduction um, that they are interested in wiping our memories clean so we don't remember and the greys themselves come across as sexless um, androids basically um, and my theory or the thesis that I had published and then of course went into belief in the other, some of the other books and I'm, I'm extending on, on a new one I'm working on at the moment um, is that the greys are in my estimation this is not linked with all UFO encounters or, or aliens as we would call them but the greys in particular are very interested in our spiritual heritage and what makes us what we are because they come across as um, you know, not understanding love or affection or the very things that make us what we are as human beings. So there does seem to be um, a very interesting parallel between the soul and of course do the greys have souls? Do they have a connection with a divine that we believe that we do? Or are they themselves outside the field of creation, whereas we understand from a religious or spiritual level that we incarnate and reincarnate and also 
are sent back into what we call the other side. So my research is very different from a lot of the nuts and bolts aspects of the phenomena because I believe that uh, with regards to the UFO phenomena, it's morphed. It seems to morph um, throughout the ages and molds itself into an image that's best comfortable or best suited with the human psyche. Um, in the in the 1900s, there were airships, and they became rockets, and then they became flying saucers, then triangles. And Dave and Neil, you mentioned uh, Betty and Barney Hill case. Well, in 1963, I think that 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 event happened in New Hampshire in America. Is that um, our population has grown now so much? There's not a lot of space for abductions to take place without someone viewing it somewhere. So. It seems that the idea of the aliens or the greys, as we call them, or that faction, have upped their abduction program on on a level of of um, of that, that deals with the psyche. Basically, what you said, the soul. Because um, I've also believed that they extract the human soul from the physical housing, from its physical housing. That's why people, when they're being abducted, can go through walls and doors and uh, they have a sense of timelessness. The greys communicate through telepathy like spirit guides or loved ones from the other side do. So it's a very, I agree, I agree with you, Dave. It's a very multifaceted, multi-complexed um, phenomena. But, mm. you know, people like yourselves ourselves have to keep digging to find the reality of this and and i must stress also absolutely um that many researchers are are watched and i'm not a conspiracy theorist we've been made to look like we're conspiracy theorists from a yes. higher organization that looks upon us and the general populace to make us look like we're idiots that we're just tra tracing some conspiracy so they've turned that finger of doubt away from themselves and onto the actual researchers who are actually doing the serious investigation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I am absolutely certain that we're dealing with something that goes beyond the level of human understanding to this degree. But I believe that most people like researchers are able to understand and open up a little bit more than the general populace would. Yes. Uh, so... Can I just sort of clarify, Dave, um, when Kathy mm -hmm. was taken aboard, she, she hasn't seen them all since that time. But, uh, no, she has, yeah. Oh, she has. She, so, so, so even though they said the next time you'll see us is when, when you die, but she's seen the she, same ones or no, different ones? No, different ones, no. Um, she had another experience uh, later on um, involving a, um, a hybrid uh, baby. Now, some of your listeners might not know what I'm talking about there, so let me go into a bit of detail. Um this occurred when she was about 19, so uh, quite a lot uh, later on. She has vivid memories. Uh, she was very ill at the time, and she, um, and she was lying on the sofa. She has vivid memories of a being of some description um, bringing her this uh, baby. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the baby was, it wasn't fully human. It was essentially half human, half grey. Um, and this is uh, an aspect of the contact phenomenon that's uh, very, very upsetting to some people, uh, especially those who, who are directly involved with it. Um, it was very, very emotional uh, discussing that with Kathy, and she uh, sort of bottled up the emotions uh, for, for years and years. Um, and uh, it's very troubling, you know. Uh, it, I, I believe that the uh, the, the Greys are essentially uh, mixing uh, DNA, um, mixing their own DNA with human DNA, and creating these uh, half breeds, uh, commonly referred to as hybrids. Uh, they will also uh, mix different species, so there's these different types that are seen again and again. And uh, some people have described seeing half, um, sort of half of one type with with half of another type so they appear to be mixing their own genetics as well as uh, with ours um now we don't really know why they're doing this uh, some researchers have got theories as to as to why they're where why they're creating these hybrids um but it's it, it's very cryptic really in in the answers given to that and there's no clear answers yet uh, but all i can say is it's a, a very real and very traumatic uh, part of, of the contact phenomena and very hard for some people to accept, but I assure you it's going on. And, and Philip, with, with your kind of own research and things like that, um, you've sort of delved into the greys and things like that. Is your experience, when, when you've sort of spoken to people or uh, your own research suggested a similar kind of thing of uh, crossbreeding? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that they are trying to remodify or to recreate themselves by using us as soul containers um i mean i know that that's a darker aspect there may be several 
um, points in question, or there may be several theories behind why the Greys are doing what they're doing, but absolutely. I mean, I, I've always believed that they have been outside the field of creationalism itself, and that because we are the byproduct of something that is spiritual, that we have an essence in us, a soul, they seem to be very interested in that aspect, or they seem to be very interested in what makes us tick, even though they don't understand it. And they use a lot of... Uh, remote influence upon the abductees so that they are a mind melding or mind control so they're very much aware of how the human mind works but it's, it's almost as if um, and as Dave quite rightly said they are actually mixing and uh, you know creating another a new hybrid species is this for them to uh, for them to explore um, existence in another body in another form um, because they seem to come across as very synthetic um, within themselves. Um, but yes, I, I really do believe that there is a darker element, and we have to address this because, you know, it's all very well, you know, running in a field full of roses and sunshine. We have to face the truth um, that we are dealing with an aspect of the UFO phenomena which, which borders along the most insane. And this is why a lot of the um, establishments or the hierarchy are keeping it secret. Because mm -hmm. they do not want the public to know what's going on behind the scenes. Are they working hand in claw with them? That's a possibility. Or do they just turn a blind eye to their secret operations? That is a great possibility. But one thing is for sure, and as Jack Vallée said, uh, I came back from the, um, the UFO conference last year um, in Arizona. He said that they still don't understand what they are dealing with. And that's shocking. Um, you know, although a lot of researchers are making some headway and at least making the public understand to a degree about it's a phenomena, it's real, but we still don't know why it's happening. And the key element, Dave and Neil, is in your abductees. They have within their minds the answers locked within their psyche. And that when an abduction takes place, normally, more times than not, the assailants will screw up the mind of the individual so that it makes it very hard for them to remember their encounter. Yes. Mm. Now, Dave, you, as your yep. role as an uh, investigator, you've got some mm -hmm. interesting cases um, that you'd like to tell us about. So um, can, we, can we move on to those? Oh, very much, yeah. I mean, we've discussed uh, Kathy's case there. Um, I mean, I can go over... I've, I've dealt with literally hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of UFO um, sightings, uh, some uh, close quarters and many, you know, much further away in the sky, um, but also uh, many contact cases. I mean, I can go over another. What, what would you like to to discuss specifically? Be, be our guest, because <laughs> you know that we don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, there's, well, there's an interesting, um, another very interesting contact case, uh, which involves some uh, physical evidence, Um uh, I mentioned earlier on that a lot of the time with uh, with uh, with abduction specifically, uh, there's not much physical evidence to kind of back that up. Um, although although there is some aspects that turn up time and time again in cases such as uh, metallic implants that are taken out of people and also body markings uh, that occur. Uh, so after the experience, they'll find markings on on their body that coincide with memories they've had of being, you know of what of what's taken place. I've dealt with quite a few cases like that. Uh, there was one particular case where the uh, where the gentleman in question woke up with a uh, red triangular mark on the uh, on the, uh, each of his inner arms. Um, had no recollection of of how they'd been there, but he, he remembered uh, being aboard a, a, a aboard essentially a craft uh, during the night, um, and and then he was left with these markings on the same night. Um, seems like much too much of a coincidence, <laughs> I would say, uh, and they did look quite artificial. But yeah, uh, a very big case I investigated occurred in um, Droitwich. Um, in, in, it came to my attention in early 2010. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, what happened with this was the, um, uh, the, the lady in question had a, a couple of abduction experiences uh, within the space of a week. Um, and it had essentially kind of triggered her, her memories. Uh, and, and she'd started to sort of look back through her life and realized that she'd had... Uh, a lot more, a lot more going on since childhood, uh, and again the the psychic element was in there. Uh, she had she uh, used to have premonitions and this sort of thing, and this this turns up time and time again with these cases. And we can look at that aspect in in more detail later in the uh, later in this discussion if you wish. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, what happened was she woke up in the middle of the night um, and just found it quite hard to sleep. It was about one in the morning. 
and she went through to check on her daughter and um they lived on the outskirts of Droitwich. um and there was a big farmer's fields outside and she she looked out and in the distance over the trees she saw um what she initially thought was a, a plane um, coming into a crash land. It was a kind of glowing oval shaped object. Uh, and then she soon realized it was moving uh, too slow uh, for it to be a plane. Uh, and it was just over the trees in the distance. So, um, you know, she, she was totally awake. She was using logic. She had a piece of paper up on the window to make sure it wasn't a reflection coming in from the room. And it wasn't. It was definitely coming from outside. So, um, you know, so she was quite with it. Uh, she turns back to look at her daughter and then she uh, glances back out the window and the object is no longer in the distance. It's now down a lot closer, about 100 yards from her house. Uh, it's down on uh, 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 right down near the grass and essentially looked like this bank of very, very bright, uh, slightly orange uh, lights. Uh, she couldn't see the actual uh, shape of the object behind the lights because it was so bright, but uh, she realised it was there. Now, uh, Philip mentioned that the uh, these beings often... Um, uh, do strange things to the minds of the individuals uh, while they're undergoing the experiences and uh, also following them. Uh, and what they'll often do is put the individual into a kind of altered state of perception where they don't act in a normal manner. So if you put yourself in her place, you know, it's the middle of the night and you look out and there's this glowing object right close to your house. I mean, what would you do? You'd wake up your family, you'd show them the object, you'd maybe ring the police. Um, but what, uh, what she did was essentially just say, okay, and then went back to bed. Uh, so she just took it as completely normal and uh, just ignored it, went back to bed. Um, she then found herself uh, very soon, within about 10 minutes, she, she feels, uh, she found herself in this other location and she was lying down and it was dark and her daughter was there, her eldest daughter, and her daughter leans into her and says, um, uh, don't worry, mum, uh, they're not going to harm you. Um, and then she feels this kind of rushing sensation and she finds herself in this other open environment. She's kind of floating uh, in this darkened space. Uh, uh, interestingly, there were these glowing uh, grid lines all around her, sort of squares of, of glowing yellow uh, lines. Uh, and that's very, very rare. I've looked into uh, other cases to try and find similarities, uh, but nothing has come up exactly the same. You do get uh, certain cases which have differences, but also many, many similarities again and again reported. So um, she sensed there was a being up behind her left shoulder, um, quite tall, uh, didn't turn around to look at it. She, uh, she was paralyzed. Uh, a lot of the time in these experiences, the individual is paralyzed. Uh, I believe that's done on purpose to uh, prevent them from essentially lashing out uh, or, or panicking um, or it's stopping what's taking place. Um, it doesn't happen all the time. It's one of the, uh, one of the myths about, um, about the abduction phenomena is that people are always paralyzed and that therefore it can be explained away as sleep paralysis or, or other things like that. Well, it's absolutely not. Um, I've dealt with many cases where the person has been able to move and has walked around the craft uh, fully freely. Uh, but a lot of the time they are paralyzed. So uh, she sensed that there were these small beings uh, around her and they, she started to feel them pressing uh, her body. They were kind of moving down her and, and touching the sides of her body, uh, doing some sort of scan or something. Um, and she was kind of scared it was going to hurt her back because she had a bad back. Um, she felt a voice in her head uh, tell her her back was, con was going to be okay. So they were talking to her telepathically. Um, uh, she then underwent a procedure, which I won't go into details, but it was quite embarrassing. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, she was very brave in, in talking, talking me through what happened with that. Uh, and then a, uh, in the distance, a uh, doorway opened all of a sudden, um, a rectangular door opens, and there's her eldest son standing in the doorway. And she's confused as to why he's there. Um, I'll, I'll get back to that. Um, so then she feels like the experience is coming to an end, uh, and um, and all uh, kind of like it's rushed, like uh, like she's been there too long. This is what she's sensing, and she can hear these uh, beings sort of talking to each other, uh, not to her directly. She can just hear them talking to each other, uh, and then all of a sudden she's uh, she finds herself back in bed. Well, she's uh, she gets up and she wakes her husband up, and she's like, "You're not going to believe what's just happened," and uh, and she was really quite you know shocked by it. Uh, she never experienced anything like it before, um, and she was really really scared. Um, uh, understandably so. Uh, she felt it was. It, it didn't really feel like a nightmare. It felt a lot more vivid. It felt a lot more like it just happened. Um, and her husband believed it was a uh, a jinn. Um, so the, the, the lady was actually Muslim. Um, and uh, something they believe in is the uh, the jinn, essentially a uh, genie. Uh, yeah. And 
or poltergeist uh, sort of poltergeist type stuff but um it wasn't that it's, it felt totally different to her and she said it couldn't be that well her husband happened to uh, put together um video cameras and um for for a living and he, he decided to set up a camera in the room um the reason for this was that she was getting more and more scared as the days went on she felt very scared about going back to bed and sleeping in the room. Um, this is extremely common for people. It's one of the after effects of, of having a contact experience. Uh, very scared to go to bed at night, of course, because you know, your mind is aware that something's taken place um, that you can't fully explain. Um, so he sets up this camera in the room to prove to her that nothing's coming for her in the night. That's it's all fine. Um, anyway, this camera sets up and they start filming every, every night. They just leave it on overnight. Several days after the camera's set up, um, she has a second experience. Uh, with this second experience, uh, she finds herself in another location now, almost like a, a doctor's office of some, descri- uh, some description. There's wooden panels all over the walls. And she's lying down on this, uh, on this flattened bench. And there's this little guy next to her, um, looks like a little doctor guy, just wearing a, a white sort of doctor's uh, coat. Uh, he's got short red hair, some glasses on. Looks human enough, uh, but strange and short. Uh, and he puts his hands over her body uh, a short distance above her and starts moving down her and explaining to her her ailments. Sort of says, like, you used to have a stomach ulcer there and this sort of thing, but it's cleared up. So he's doing some sort of body scan. Um, and again, she senses the big being up by her shoulder. And um, and then the experience comes to an end, you know, after she believes about 15 minutes, which is quite a quick thing. And she feels this rushing sensation. All of a sudden, she's bang, she's back in the bed. Again, realizes, you know, really, really scared. Again, realizes something very strange has gone on. Wakes her husband up. They go back off to sleep um, in the um, in the morning, of course. They've got the uh, the camera, haven't they? So they, they go and have a look. Like, okay, let's say uh, something happened in the night. Maybe something will turn up on the camera. Well, yeah, lo and behold, uh, about 3.33 in the morning, or just after, um, all of a sudden, uh, the sheets seem to kind of rise up a bit. Uh, sort of like she's almost like she's arcing her back in the bed, uh, and then all of a sudden they just um sink right down really, really flat, almost like she's uh, dematerialized. Um, so she doesn't float out of bed or float through a window or float up to the ceiling or anything like that, don't see anything like that. But she appears to dematerialize from the bed. Um, bed sheets lay completely still for about 13 14 minutes. And then all of a sudden, they're just right up really high in the air. And when they settle back down, she's uh, back there in bed. Now, um, she was quite a big lady, and it just seemed impossibly flat, the sheets, for it to be an optical illusion. Um, and it did seem to coincide with the uh, with this second experience, you know, with the length of time it had taken and, and this sort of thing. Now... If if that video is real, and I've got no doubt that they, um, you know, there's no doubt that it's a real video, as in they didn't hoax it. I don't believe that for a second. Um, they actually sent the video off to uh, the uh, program Fact or Fate. It's an American-based TV mm-hmm. show where they essentially take paranormal videos and try to prove or disprove them. And uh, that that featured on one of the episodes of their show, and they couldn't disprove the video. They uh, they were able to uh, replicate it with the use of kind of hydraulics inside the bed and this sort of nonsense. Um, I saw the room where this took place and I saw the camera it was filmed on. Um, and I assure you that it, it was not a hoax video. The, the family, uh, especially the lady involved, were extremely uh, scared of what had taken place. It was quite obvious that they suffered emotional trauma from it all. Um, mm. Now, if that video is is real, then it it is, I believe, a, a, a genuine abduction taking place on camera and, and therefore very, very important. Mm. I've, um, seen, I've seen that video because you did show it at the, it. Uh, yes. the probe conference, didn't you? And everyone yes, was open mouthed. I remember that when they <laughs> saw that, there's gasping in amazement. And um, is it available for people to view on YouTube? It, it is indeed. Um, I wouldn't look for it on YouTube. Uh, it's been um, nabbed by various people. Uh, probably the best place to look at it would be on the Bufog website if you go to the uh, contactee uh, cases section. And look for the Droitwich uh, case. It's inside the case report, including full uh, detailed analysis by myself. So, yeah, you can have a watch of it there. Droit, Droitwich, was that? Yes. Droit, okay, yeah. it's not a town I'm familiar with. It's um, just on but, the outskirts of Birmingham. Okay. So, uh, you mentioned her son standing in the doorway or something. You said you I did indeed. To that. Yeah. I did indeed, yeah. And actually, this links with the second experience as well with the little doctor guy. So, um, Quite often, these uh, these beings um, they they do um, portray a different appearance to themselves, um, and sometimes 
uh, the the kind of mask sort of slips away a bit, um, and in flashbacks, people can sort of start to see them in their true form. Um, and also, hypnotic regression again, very very controversial. And uh, you know, many people may say, okay, she was un- she was under hypnosis, so she could have false memories. And it's it's very true that false memories can occur with hypnotic regression, and it's the reason why a lot of contactees don't choose to go down that route in the first place. However, with her experience, she had quite a lot of memories already, and essentially the hypnotic regression just seemed to sort of fill in the gaps a bit. Uh, now, with the, with the first experience, um, she no longer saw her son standing in the doorway, uh, what she described was a, a, a very tall, um, thin uh, being, slender arms, long, uh, large head, um, round black eyes, it was essentially a grey, uh, a very tall grey, about eight foot high. Um, now her son was uh, was quite it, it is quite tall, so that would that would match. And it, it appeared that they'd used the image of her son and, and masked um, and masked that. With the uh, second experience, again with the uh, the, little, the little doctor guy, this one's uh, real really fascinating because um, the uh, hypnotic regressionist a guy named Rob, uh, I no longer work with him. He's uh, sort of moved away, but. Um, he, he asked her to describe this little guy. And uh, she said, uh, his face looks like it wants to fall off. That's the word she used. Um, mm. And then and then he said, okay, can you describe the hands? And she said, oh, they human hands. Uh, and then a moment later, she's, no, no, they, they don't look right. They're too, the fingers are too long and pointed. Um, and what I believe was happening with this was that the being next to her was a grey, uh, putting on this persona of a doctor, uh, and uh, this this fits in with other cases. I've looked into other cases where exactly the same thing's been described by these beings. Just, uh, they um, hide themselves in the form of a, a, a doctor, as you're wearing a kind of white coat, um, and it may be because of the kind of cl- how clinical the environment looks and how clean that it, it's very reminiscent of being in a hospital ward mm-hmm. um, uh, with doctors around. Um, and, and, and some people after it actually get a phobia of hospitals or sometimes the dentist uh, because of the similarities uh, to, to their contact experience. It does leave lasting phobias with people. Uh, one of the many reasons why I believe we're dealing with a real thing here with contact. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that there is it's commonly called a screen memory. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, my personal belief on, uh, on what's happening with that is that they are masking their appearance to um, essentially cause less fear in the person undergoing the experience. And uh, quite often they will choose something. It, it's almost like they go in and cherry pick something from the person's mind. Um, there's one particular case I dealt with where, the, uh, where the, the man involved had an interest in the military and he'd always wanted to grow up to be a soldier. And they, descri- uh, they essentially uh, appeared to him as, a, as American soldiers holding guns. Um, really? It was, wow. Yeah, it, and uh, there's another case where um, where two girls from the 1950s, one of the earliest cases I've looked into, but um, I think it was 1954 that had an experience, and the um, and these beings appeared to them in the form of these um, men in suits with these um, fedora hats on. And you may think that has similarities to the uh, the men in black, and there is that kind of link there with that. But I believe that these were again beings, and they were putting on the appearance of how how men would address back in the 1950s. So that you know, they chose something that was familiar to the uh, to the girls, something they would see uh, every day in normal life. Um, so that's my take on on what's going on with that. I believe they do it to prevent the um, the fear uh, of the experience and make it seem more normal. But of course, sometimes that doesn't always work. It's an interesting thing because uh, we did have uh, David Caton speak at High Wycombe Paranormal Group um, yes. at the end of November, and one of the cases he mentioned was uh, the radio telescope, I uh, forget which one it was, uh, up in the northeast or northwest of Britain. Um, and I believe a UFO was spotted flying around there, but this lady identified, she said it made the sound of a spitfire, <laughs> which was sort of a, an old <laughs> kind of Merlin engine type of sound, you know. And yep. you're thinking, hang on, these things are normally silent, and this one's chugging away, flying around <laughs> this uh, radio dish. And, she, and yep. Dave, David uh, uh, Caton was under the impression that he, he believes they kind of try and blend in with our society to a certain extent yes. and mimic as best as they can. But he said they sometimes get things wrong. Uh, yep. and, and like the, the era was wrong, he felt in that case. And this is why it was doing the sound of a spitfire. Uh, and you, you saw about the lady suspecting that the face was about to fall off this, this small doctor as if they can't quite uh, 
mimic everything yes. totally. And there's been cases, yes. hasn't there, where, where people see owls or something and they suddenly change Very back common. into the grey or something like that. Yeah. Now, now, Philip, you had a, 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 a... Was it a case of a wizard-type character that you felt could have been alien? Well, yes, that was um, that was back in the winter of 1989, and that that character was more of a more human in appearance, but still the shape of a grey. Um, uh, I, I, that that illustration has uh, did go into one of my books, but um, that that was more of a wizard type um, being that was very very bizarre after the initial abduction uh, that I had, that uh, has taken me a long time to deal with and come to terms with because it was very um, embarrassing and, and also very uh, very deep and, and it took me a long time to actually come to terms with what happened initially in the winter of 1989 with that. But yes, I, I had seen one of them and, and the communication is done very much through mental means or mm-hmm. uh, a process of mental communication that is almost as if you can hear the voices um, but they they come on almost mechanically, like a robot. Um, so, yes, I, I did have that. And interestingly, going back to what you said, um, Dave and Neil, about the UFOs moulding into our reality, well, um, and, and trying to, as best they can, to disguise themselves. I've had four visions. Uh, when I say visions, very powerful dreams, because I've been asking for some help in higher levels, if that may sound ridiculous, but the dreams I've had are all the same. And I, I see in these dreams these UFOs, and I'm so amazed and pointing at them, and, and they're coming closer. And as they come closer, they turn into, and I'm holding them, and it turns into like an old can or something, piece of rubbish. And I've tried to work out the symbology between this, and I think what I'm seeing here is that they will appear to us as things that we wouldn't even recognize, even if it was put straight in front of our eyes. Um, un- unless, of course, they're interacting with the individual on that very strong physical stroke psychic level. So I do agree with you totally that they are masking themselves or masquerading a- a- around in-, in objects that we would now today find very difficult to distinguish. Is it them or is it us? You, you see what I mean there. So um, I'm still working on that one. But it is a very, very multi but also fascinating subject. And, and I've always had that I don't know what it is, like you, Dave, like you, Neil, a real, real deep, you know, wanting to know the truth and only the yep. truth. When you bypass all the disinformation and the, the fakery and, and all the rest of it, the truth is what we're after. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. I think what we'll do, we'll take a break here now, gentlemen, and we'll return okay. in a few minutes after these uh, commercials. And uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about um, something that's uh, of interest to Philip in particular, which is the Reynolds from Forest case. And uh, I know that uh, Dave has some knowledge of that. And there's been a lot of uh, talking and tweeting and everything about Reynolds from Forest case uh, of late. And it's also, I think, it's coming up to its anniversary in a few years' time. And they're planning a conference, I believe. Well, that's certainly uh, the talk at the moment anyway, a, a sort of a, an anniversary of the, con- uh, of the Reynolds from Forest case. So we'll talk a little bit about that after the break so stay tuned for some more after this Glenet High Publishing is proud to announce the release of our latest novel The Demdike Legacy by Barry Durham set in a quiet village in Lancashire England an enigmatic murder reignites a legacy of witchcraft thought to have died out 400 years before when the Pendle Witches were hanged at Lancaster Castle in 1612. As the death pole rises, the descendants of the original Pendle Witches are forced out of hiding and assist the police in tracking down the killer before they are all wiped out. The Demdike Legacy is a thrilling mystery novel that blends modern detective work with old world pagan practices. The Demdike Legacy is now available in both softcover and ebook formats on Amazon.com and at glanatai.com. Glanatai Publishing is pleased to announce the release of the award-winning novel The Girl Who Wrote Dolphins by Michael Gannis. A mysterious young girl is discovered in the ocean off the coast of Haiti, surrounded by a pod of the most extraordinary dolphins ever encountered. Together, they protect a secret cove on Navassa Island teeming with life and which holds mysterious secrets that must be protected at all costs from dark forces intent on exploiting them. 
The winner of five book awards, The Girl Who Wrote Dolphins, is an exciting, nail-biting adventure set in the Caribbean Ocean that will leave you spellbound with its mixture of high seas action and unique mysticism. The Girl Who Wrote Dolphins is available in both softcover and ebook format on Glanatai.com, Barnes and Noble, and Amazon.com. Good evening, Agent 47. It has come to our attention, through the highest intelligence sources, that Irene Allen Block has published her novel, The Psychic Spy. Our sources tell us that The Psychic Spy is a riveting thriller about Eileen Evans, a beautiful young psychic who is recruited by British intelligence during the Cold War to participate in their top-secret remote viewing spy program. Eileen soon finds herself plunged deeper into the darkest heart of the intelligence community as she is ultimately trained as a spy and a psychic assassin. Nick Redfern says the psychic spy is filled with adventure, intrigue, and shadowy characters. And as Irene Allen Block shows, the mind is a mysterious and dangerous tool. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to immediately purchase a copy of The Psychic Spy by Irene Allen Block, available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Glanatai.com. This tape will self-destruct in one second. Deep in the heart of the XYZ files, mulled wine and sulky are hard at work on trying to prove predictions are coming true. Now for God's sake, pick another card, Eric Bora. I am not Eric. I am mulled wine. Don't let me lose my concentration. Well, kill that goddamn off on music. Look, it puts me in the right frame of mind to predict the future with my special psychic spirit cards. And what predictions for 2017 do you have? Well, James, I predict that the multi-billionaire Donald Trump will be president by January 2017. Oh, good God. And also, I predict, please, thank you, Thank you, Pam. The Z Files will return for next year. Oh, please, draw another card. Uh, wait, 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 I've got something, I've got something. What? Come on, what do you see? I'm seeing what looks like, curiously, some kind of peep show. Yes, something peeping, a peeping randigate. Oh, uh, that was this year and the charges were dropped. No, no, I'm feeling it very strongly. Paranorm, pa paranorm, paran, para, para, parachute. No, no, it's not parachute. Paratrooper. Pa no, no, not pa. No, it's paran, paranorm. A peep show. A peep show about the paranormal. A paranormal peep show. Sir, you are not normal. No, paranormal peep show, definitely. Thank you, Pam. Coming January 2017 with Andy Chaplin and Neil Geddes Ward. I don't know who they are. I can see it on the cards. Join Andy and Neil as they take a peek into the paranormal stories of past and present, starting January 2017 on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, the deep right center, that goes Lewis to the wall, and it's out of here! Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find news and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. This is Barry Fitzgerald from Ghost Hunters International. In my book, In the Mist of Gods, I explore the world of the fairies or fae. This is not the whimsical winged creatures romanticized in modern literature and popular culture, but old world intelligent and sometimes dangerous beings hidden in the tunnels, mounds and rafts in countries all over the world. Known by many names, the fae coexist with mankind and at times come in direct contact with unsuspecting people whose lives are changed forever. 
In the Mystic Gods is a powerful book that chronicles my years of research into the enigma and legend of the fairy and examines their metamorphosis into the modern day extraterrestrial phenomena. In the Mist of Gods is available in both soft cover and Kindle format on Amazon and on glanantea.com. This lady called Helen Duncan is actually, I think, one of the most interesting people I've ever come across. Now, she um, was born in Calendar in Scotland in, 18, in 1897, and um, in 1944, she became the last person ever to be uh, imprisoned under the Witchcraft Act of 1735. When she was at school and she couldn't answer a question, she used to put the school book under her chair, and she put it out later and someone had written in the answers. Albert is the name of her spirit guide, and he's a tall man with a strong Australian accent, and he came through... I'm very sorry to have to tell you that a British battleship has just been sunk. I have a 1,400 of her officers and men newly arrived in the spirit world with me. And there's a big gasp in the audience. Physical light is too much of a, a strong element to um, work with under physical seance conditions. And she said that, that basically um, she was exposed to normal daylight or, or, or room interior light, interior light. She said that ectoplasm was coming out of her eye and it whipped back into her eye. As it did so, it lashed against her face like a whip and caused like a burn across her face. Spiritualism offers a third position, and I think this is this is obviously a third position that the government don't want us to have. Mm, now, this this very much leads into the whole kind of like Illuminati control structure in terms of keeping the masses dumbed down and stupid and watching, you know, soap operas and things and not focusing on what is the government really doing and what is life really all about. Have you ever wanted to visit the south of Italy? Amalfi, Ravello, Pazzitano, Sorrento, places of immense beauty on the Amalfitana coast. Nearby Vesuvia stands proud against the sky, shadowing the ancient Roman ruins of Pompeii. Take a boat ride to the Isle of Capri, tour the island and make sure to visit the Blue Grotto. Sit in the charming piazza cafes of Amalfi or Ravello, or visit the quaint shops and the must-see churches and villas. Cool off bathing in the clear blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea. In the midst of all this beauty lies the picturesque hillside village of Pantoni that dates back to the Middle Ages. Pantoni, with its relaxed atmosphere, boasts two pizza restaurants, the Trattoria L'Antico Borgo and that of San Giovanni. You can also eat or just have a drink of your choice while sitting at the table under the canopy at the Blue Bar in the Piazza, close to the 12th century church of St. Giovanni. Pantoni, with its old aristocratic houses, bell towers, and churches, is a great starting point for hikers and lovers of nature and mountain trails. To the Valle della Ferrari, or the famous Tower of the Zero. The tower is where the Duchess of Amalfi, Giovanna of Aragon, also known as the Mad Giovanna, who was imprisoned in the tower centuries ago. Stay in Pontoni, in the self-catering apartments of Il Petrale, the beautiful casa belonging to Caramiana Respoli, who will warmly welcome you when you arrive. Sit out on the veranda looking at the valley down to the town below of Amalfi, Il Petrale, a haven of peace in the heart of this magnificent place called Pontoni. For more information, email us at carminerispoli at email.it. That's carminerispoli, C-A-R-M-I-N-E-R-I-S-P-O-L-I, at email.it. The Work of Medium Philip Kinsella the reading that I had by Philip this evening was spot on. I feel it's important for those people who are waiting for their message from their loved ones to show how they pass over and what part they played in that person's life. The spirit will then probably talk about the person that they're coming through, about their life, and about what they're worried about, what their concerns are. Normally a spirit will remember how they passed over, but sometimes it's not always the case. Some, sometimes a spirit will pass over very tragically, very violently, and they're left in confusion. So all I will get is a jumble of confused memories. What was, was she spying on someone next door? 
<laughs> oh, wait, looking at wait, Oh, wait. my goodness. <laughs> I don't get the problem of spirits um, sending in me into three people at one time. I may have what I call a cue jump that will come in, but I will notice that as I'm reading for a particular person in the audience. There's someone else knocking on the door, basically, and wanting to come in. So once I've finished my reading, I will then go to that person. At all. And sometimes it's difficult, because when you get a cue jump or someone from the other side that seems to jump the queue, you've got to find your link with that person. Normally I go directly to an individual and read for them. Other times someone will come on um, and through to your consciousness and throw you slightly. Yeah, okay. he was spot on with everything he said. Brilliant. There wasn't one thing he didn't say that wasn't true. To find out more about the psychic work of Philip Kinsella, visit philip-kinsella.co.uk. That's philip-kinsella.co.uk. Hello, this is Lord Lewis Smythe, formerly of the House of Lords, and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Welcome back to part two of the Paranormal Peep Show with myself, Neil Geddesward, and Andy Chaplin. Hello. Andy, over to you. Um, right, so Philip, um, one of the major incidents within the UK, possibly the number one incident, is of course the Rendlesham Forest incident. And there's been a lot of speculation about whether the light that appeared was um, a lighthouse in the distance that was flashing or whether it was really a UFO. Um, I don't know if you want to kind of enlighten us and, and tell us what well, your take on it. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I have to totally discount the theory of the lighthouse <clears throat> because that is ridiculous. I mean, we, we myself, my, my twin brother Ronald and uh, a friend of ours, Susan, um, used to make a lot of trips to Rendlesham uh, under the recommendation of Peter Robbins and Larry Warren that, I, uh, that we had met at a local UFO group called Beams, the British Earth and Aerial Mystery Society, which, which had been created by Kenneth John Parsons and of which I had worked alongside for a few years and on entering the forest um, it is very very strange because Peter Robbins had told us that there's a lot of strange things happening there so it was our chance to go and you know check it out and um, we had a lot of strange activity that are uh, too long to mention uh, on this uh, radio program but uh, a lot of paranormal things have been going on there and lights have been seen but um, I can definitely vouch to you and not just the armchair viewers that um, who scoff at this, but it is a very strange place and steeped in a lot of ancient controversy. Um, we had witnessed in um, 1998 a huge UFO um, that we had summoned using me uh, by meditating a week before um, because we wanted to see them. You know, we, we'd asked, uh, we wanted to see if it was true uh, that they were real. And um, we were, were, were re rewarded with a sighting of a, of a massive triangular-shaped craft with a circular undercarriage that uh, made no sound but um, was beautiful um, and very, very strange to explain in words um, exactly, uh, you know, the whole, the whole drama that unfolded. But I, I documented this in, in Believe, my book, one of my books, Believe, and Sky Crash Throughout Time, which I co-authored with the original investigator, Brenda Butler. She was the co-author with Jenny Randalls and Dot Street to Sky Crash, A Cosmic Conspiracy, uh, that came out um, back in 1984 by Neville Spearman. And we decided, myself and Brenda, who I met um, through some form of synchronicity in the forest. I didn't know that she lived there or, or was, uh, was residing there. And um, we teamed up and, and um, I'd been out with Brenda and uh, we'd done a lot of night vigils. And we had also been hounded by um, military helicopters um, that, that wanted us out of the forest uh, because we'd, out there, we'd been out there very late at night. Um, and um, the experiences were very strange. I mean, that was some years ago now, and uh, I had the zest and energy then to go out there and do all the running and, you know, the uh, um, uh, Mulder and Scully stuff, you know. <laughs> um, but yes, it is, it is very real, and I don't doubt that the military um, had actually seen a craft of unusual origins um, they were very guarded about this whole thing. It was steeped in a lot of uh, secrecy. 
Um, and um, and now it's it's come to light not just only from Colonel Charles Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt, but also from Penicillin and Burroughs, who were the two um, men who actually saw the original craft when it had landed mm. um, outside of the base during the initial nineteen the winter of nineteen eighty event. Philip, have you but, been to the actual um, exact location where they saw um, yes. the UFO? Now, yes. now, now, putting my kind of like my scientist skeptics hat um, on, can you see the lighthouse from there? Can we completely discount the lighthouse? I mean, you cannot see the lighthouse. You can see the beam of, of the awkwardness lighthouse, but I can assure you of one thing. It is too weak to represent any form of UFO or, or object for that matter. And if the military, if the US military were chasing the lights from the light, the Orphanus Lighthouse, God help our military. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Those mm. men had seen and were um, hounded by a UFO of such extraordinary origin that you're, you're going to tell me that they would take out the, most of the military out there to go and chase the light from the Orford Nest Lighthouse. It's a cover story, and mm. it's, it's, ru- it's complete, total rubbish. It, so it's, it's sort of the, the old swamp gas, you know, foil balloon. It's a modern-day version of it, isn't mm. it, really? I mean, Dr. J. Allen Hynek actually walked out when, when they, they said many years ago in a press conference that that's what some witnesses had seen because he was so disgusted by the hoaxing and the cover-up. It's, it's, I mean, I've seen lighthouses. I've been to, I mean, you know, we're not all see, uh, all living on the coast and things like that. But, you know, when we go on holidays and things like that, I've, I've seen lighthouses up close and, and from distances. And, and you can see them. And I don't ever jump to the conclusion, oh, my God, it's a UFO. And, and as Philip said, you know, these are trained military people. And if they've been on that base... Uh, for a fair few years, I mean, obviously some are posting over there from the United States on regular, you know, uh, they come over for their first stint. Um, they, they're going to pretty learn sooner or later that there's a lighthouse out in the vicinity. So, you know, on the Christmas night, they're not likely to sort of jump out and think, oh, my God, there's a UFO. It must be a lighthouse or, or whatever or mistake it because they've seen the lighthouse previous nights in that winter anyway. Yeah, it's, so it's, why nothing, would they it's suddenly... nothing new to them, is it? It's that, not that's like exactly any... right. It's familiar territory. Um, so, so for the MOD or skeptics or whoever's trying to to write off the whole thing under the guise of a lighthouse, you know, I mean, it doesn't. It... Well, Penniston actually described, you know, going up to with Burroughs the craft that they that was witnessed by them, and that was no light from a lighthouse. That was a physical structured craft. So, you know, um, that that is that is something that most people tend to discount. Um, but you know, I believe their testimony. I've seen them talk, and I've 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 met most of them, and I can tell you that those guys were pretty screwed up by the encounter, um, um, as well. So you know, they can try and fob it, us all off by making us believe it was this or that. But when you're actually there, when you're in the forest, when you have these experiences, it's a very different experience altogether, totally. Mm. Dave, uh, what, what's your take on all this? Yeah, um, I mean, talking about the lighthouse theory, uh, that, that I, I agree, fully agree, that is nonsense. Um, it's uh, the theory has actually been put together by uh, Ian Ridpath, a uh, known uh, UFO uh, skeptic, or some may say debunker, um, and his theory ignores uh, about nine tenths of the evidence for the Rendlesham case. Uh, all it takes into account is Colonel Holt and what he saw through the forest uh, on on that. When, when they went out to investigate, seeing this pulsing light through the trees. Uh, it doesn't take into account what they came across in the farmer's field as a glowing, uh, a, a glowing oval-shaped object with what looked like molten metal dripping off it. Uh, it doesn't take into account the fact that it then went up into the sky and there were multiple objects firing down beams of light at their feet. Um, now, I'm pretty sure that lighthouses don't do that. So <laughs> <laughs> that theory is just blown out of the water. And that's just the one night. Uh, this, this took place over three nights and there were multiple craft. Um, some of them went in over the base and were shining beams of light down into the weapons storage area uh, where they were holding nukes. And I believe the uh, main reason for the cover-up of the Rendlesham Forest incident is the fact that they were uh, they were not supposed to have nukes on the base at that time. And these, uh, these craft were essentially scanning the nuclear warheads. Uh, now, there's many other cases on record uh, over the last century, right up to present day, uh, where this is going on, and I believe it's one of the main reasons for the cover-up of the UFO subjects at large. 
So, are you, are you saying then, Dave, that um, they're trying to cover up the fact that uh, they've got nuclear weapons where they shouldn't be, and, and this is why they're trying to sort of cover up the UFO stories as well? Um, I, b- I believe that one aspect of it is the fact that they had nukes there and they weren't supposed to, um, and they uh, they made... Uh, they they essentially were supposed to be no nuclear warheads stored on the base at that time, but they almost absolutely were. Um, the other thing is the fact that they don't want the public to know that these beings and their craft are essentially monitoring our nuclear program are, and are in fact in control of it. Um, there have been many cases um, on record, uh, including uh, all nuclear we- all nuclear facilities uh, in in America. Uh, and also plutonium creation uh, facilities as well, uh, where uh, UFOs have come in over these bases and have uh, actively investigated them, uh, in some cases actually switching off nuclear warheads or even turning them on. Uh, and this is across both America and, uh, and Russia. Uh, it's a worldwide thing, and it's, it's really going on. I've, I've heard about this, and there, there was one point um, which they were almost about to launch, um, and then it was kind of averted last minute, from what I understand. Yes. Absolutely. That, that's a place in Russia. They had uh, no failsafe on it. Uh, mm. they, the, uh, in Amer- it. It also happened in America on another occasion, but they had a safety switch. Uh, in Russia, they had no safety switch at the time, and they were terrified that it was going to actually launch the nukes. Now, what I believe is going on with this, and there's different takes on why they're doing this, but I believe it's a display of power to show our military what they're capable of, and, uh, you know, and if they want to, they can switch on and off our nukes uh, uh, at will. Now, there's no way that the military would want that going large and, and want the general public to be aware of that information. It would create absolute panic uh, mm. to know that we're not in control of that situation. There could, mm. there could be another angle, possibly, in that if these are um, positive ETs, let's just like, hypothetically say they're positive, they could be saying, look, um, the reality is if you were to use these, just think of the implications and kind of like getting it to that stage where they're almost about to to launch obviously got people to adrenaline going and thinking about oh my god what if they actually launch what a mistake that would be that, maybe it's kind of some something along the lines of hey humans what are you doing think about this carefully that's an that's an interesting take on it but but then i say why why not just switch all our nukes off because um, we'd probably we'd rebuild more and we'd switch them back on yeah, again yeah <laughs> it's true <laughs> um yeah, it does seem to be kind of random missile bays in, in random locations and random missile tests. Uh, however, the, um, in the contact phenomena, uh, a lot of contactees are kind of shown environmental type uh, warnings by these beings. Uh, quite often they're shown images, uh, sometimes directly into their heads as a kind of vision, uh, other times on a sort of physical screen aboard the craft. And they're shown kind of uh, the, the world exploding, bombs going off, uh, forest fires, this sort of thing. This is a uh, this is a regular uh, thing that's reported uh, in contact experience. With um, the fact that you know they're, they're switching off uh, nuclear missiles and letting contactees know that there's a possibility of nuclear war by visions and things like that. Mm-hmm. There's an argument. I mean, I've been listening to one of our friends, Ben Emlyn Jones, have a discussion with uh, a friend of his online. Uh, skeptics debate and this this guy Colin um, which I'd love to maybe get on here at some point um, is, a, is a skeptic of everything basically uh, ghosts UFOs fairies you know you name it, it he, he doesn't want to believe in it um, it's up to him of course at the end of the day but one of the arguments he says and that of others is that if, if there's UFOs why don't they land on the White House lawn uh, and and leading from that I could then say playing devil's advocate why don't the ETs, or whoever they are, that is, uh, we assume they're ETs, why don't they give these visions to the leading presidents or parliamentary people of the world of nuclear war and things like that? Because surely uh, you really should be kind of talking to the leaders. It, it is that old thing of take me to your leader, mm-hmm. I would have thought. What do, mm-hmm. what do you guys think? Um, yeah, my take on that, uh, first of all, the, uh, the not landing on the White House lawn, good old cliche, um, is that I believe that these beings are working covertly uh, on an o- ongoing uh, genetic type program over a long period of time. Uh, I think it's been going on for centuries, and uh, I don't see any signs of it coming to an end, at least not in the cases I've been investigating. Um, and was, I believe- wasn't there a, a flyby of UFOs in the 1940s over the White House? Well? 52, there was indeed, yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah. 52. Yeah. Um, they do occasionally present themselves openly to the public, uh, but a lot of the time you'll find that cases occur in very rural areas uh, or in the dead of night when there's, when there's not many people around, uh, and I believe that that's on purpose so that they're, they're not observed 
observed by by other people. Uh, there's also this time distortion element that goes on with many cases where they appear to kind of shut down the surrounding area so other people may may not witness it because they've kind of been temporarily sort of switched off, uh, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, I believe they're certainly working covertly, although at times have openly presented themselves for whatever reason, uh, such as the Phoenix Lights incident, absolutely incredible case, um, and ab- absolutely them rather than military, I would say, with that one. Um, now, as, as, for the, um, as for the other point, um, which it, it sort of leads on from that, really, um, I, th- I think... Sorry, I lost my trap there. <laughs> OK, I was just saying about the president... <laughs> Uh, why, why are the That's right. contacting presidents? And- Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, my personal take is that they are changing the uh, the contactees themselves on a kind of subconscious level. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, the individuals undergoing these experiences, they, they'll have sort of deep, deep conversations with these beings. And at the time, it makes perfect sense to them. Yeah, but after their experience, when they think back to it, they have very little recollection of what was actually discussed. They know they've had a deep conversation of some kind, uh, and, and they realize it, it's very sort of, Deep things were discussed, often complex mathematics, but they can't remember it after the fact. And it's my belief that they are they're changing the contactees on a subconscious level. Now, why they're doing this and, and to what gains, we don't yet know. Uh, it's possible that they, they uh, are not aware that uh, telling these random individuals uh, are, are of the public, because that's what it appears to be, a kind of random uh, take of the, of the public um, get taken, all walks of life, all age groups. Slight uh, female to male ratio, uh, but, but not too much. Um, so they may not be aware that telling these individuals isn't going to actually change that much on a global level, uh, or they may have some bigger plan that we, we're not yet aware of. Philip, do you agree that uh, they're taking people randomly or is there more of a, a kind of uh, an agenda behind the whole thing? I believe that there is an agenda and I, I have to go back to the, the point in question that if I can use the greys as an example as, the, as we call them, um, is that um, they, they obviously, as Dave said before, and I agree most definitely, is that they target certain individuals for their program or convert programs, genetic, spiritual, whatever. Now, the other interesting thing is, is that it appears to me that the military themselves are, cannot control them. And I am under the impression that there is a huge installation, not only just in England, but also in America, where they are underground bases, where they are monitoring these objects <coughs> on a daily basis. And I believe that they are aware also of the individuals who are abducted. And I remembered speaking to a very um, high-up gentleman uh, whose name I cannot disclose and will not, and that is not for sensationalism. Um, But he told me that you would be surprised, he said, on what files they have on researchers and abductees. And uh, and, and I kind of like grinned and and asked him, you know, I is it true that, you know, are these things true? And his reply was just a nod in the yes. So, and also they, the UFO phenomena or, or certain aspects of UFOs are trying to put us in our place to say, you know, catch us if you can, but we are definitely in charge. So I don't think the military are in charge of this. I believe that they try to explore all avenues of the technology or um, the, the certainly the morphogenic parts of technology because these things seem to mold themselves and manifest into different images. Um, so I don't think the military are totally in the know. I think they, they have an understanding of it, but yes. I don't think they have a complete hold on it. No. <laughs> I, think, I think they'd like to be in control of it, but they're not. They're just, they, they, they want to be controllers, but they, they can't help but be observers for the most part, I think. You know what they say? They say the best way to control or to subjugate um, someone is through silence. And that's exactly what they've done. They've kept silent. They have not in any way given any clue as to what us researchers are trying to look for. They're not. It's up to us. And we're the people, uh, many, many people, wonderful people, who they consider ordinary. God knows what they are if they're not ordinary. Um, But it's up to us to try and find the answers because they have have not done any work in any avenue to help the public in any way. There have been a few whistleblowers, but normally they get killed or they're disgraced or or they just disappear. 
Now, for, for listeners um, hearing a very strange alien type noise, that was in fact someone sneezing, I think. <laughs> um, but Dave, I believe you've got a, a, a point to add on this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this kind of links into the, uh, the, the men in black phenomena. Um, so are you all there still? Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. we're all awake. Sorry, it's, it's, gone, it's, it's gone very, very quiet. We're not they, they, they haven't abducted us. <laughs> no, good. Um, <laughs> yeah, essentially, the uh, the Men in Black phenomenon is is real and and does uh, and does occur in certain contact cases and indeed uh, just straight up UFO sightings. Uh, but a lot of the time, pe- people are under the impression that the Men in Black just uh, tell tell people not to talk to the public and and they're like, you mustn't tell the, you mustn't tell anybody about what you saw. It was the planet Venus. Uh, and there are ca- there are cases on record that are exactly Exactly like that. Absolutely, where they've warned people. Um, there, there's a there's actually a case in, involving my group, which I can go over in a minute, uh, involving a kind of backward psychology on on that level. But um, but a lot of the time with the uh, with the cases, they appear to be trying to find out more information from the contactees themselves. So they'll ask them a lot of questions, or they might tap their phone, um, or, or just watch them and monitor them. And it's almost like they're trying to find out about the these beings through the contactees because they're aware that they've had experiences so they don't so they don't tell them not to talk about their experiences but they, they try to gain information from them uh, and i've had I've, I've had a number of cases like that in fact uh, probably more than half of the cases involving men uh, men in black uh, type incidents have been on on that level rather than a direct warning now with with obviously they're, they're, they're trying to listen in and try and find out more about them and what they want now uh, we always talk about the roswell thing as, as like one of the famous mm-hmm. crash retrievals of, of like uh, the 20th century and there's been other cases uh, that people talk about in new mexico and things like that and we've supposedly got a few crash retrievals occurring on british soil that you know about dave is that right yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean the Berwyn Mountains uh, incident in Wales. That was uh, that was probably one of the most famous ones. And they, you know, they claimed that that was a kind of uh, a meteorite that uh, um, gone into the uh, hillside. But um, the military uh, cordoned off the area, and there were there were many many witnesses to that. You know, that was were seeing sort of bright lights over the mountain in the air. You know, before the before it occurred, there was a very very loud um, sound of, of something hitting hitting the mountainside, and then uh, and then. Uh, an apparent cover up by the military, so yeah, it certainly tends to suggest a, a, a UFO crash. I mean, we could talk about Bowen Mountains for for hours, which we haven't got, but um, yeah, it's all available online. There's four websites um, uh, available uh, about that case. And any other ones of more recent times? Because that was in the mid seventies, I believe, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah. That was a good. That was a good while back. Um, no, really, really recent ones that I'm aware of. I, I don't know about you, Philip. Are you aware of any recent UFO crashes? Well, in no, I'm, all, I'm, I'm always on the lookout, but most of the times I, I hear from people asking why is it that these UFOs only crash in remote areas. Well, my answer to that is because they have been forced down by our military, and the military will then, what they will do very, very, very cleverly is make sure that the craft is in a desolate region or try to bring it down in an area that isn't overpopulated. Um, and yep. this, this is exactly where you can go into a whole new area of military back engineered projects which i do believe most definitely and and of the military trying to replicate um new machinery or machinery that they can try to understand from alien technology as we call it um but that is why um, the ufos do come down in remote areas because i i think you know i've said before about this whole thing about ufos um we we deal uh, that, that you know that, that can travel apparently faster than light they, they blink in and out very quickly interdimensionally or or they morph their crafts so i will tell you that when i was in arizona at the the conference um last year um in february and they showed a film footage um of of, of a military uh, film footage of a ufo um that was like a disc and uh, an, orb, an orb sorry and and it went into the water, split in two, and morphed back into one again. And and this captivated the audience, which means that we're dealing with a technology that goes beyond our current level of understanding. Or is it? It could be that you know we are given all the kindergarten pieces, and the military have the uh, Aladdin's lamp of technology, or most of that anyway. And I'm Absolutely. sure you've heard about the breakaway civilization that's come into a lot of the talk lately about and I think that means that the military are keeping hold of their secret projects and we, we are just a fodder to them that's given just the, the bits and pieces to toy around with. Mm. Um, 
Yeah. Almost like the Hunger Games Society sort of class system. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you've got the, you've oh, got definitely. Oh, God, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've got, to, I've got to say this, guys. I don't know if you guys um, were aware, aware of this. On the independent.co.uk website, there's mm-hmm. something about fast radio bursts. Scientists oh, find yes. Yes. the source of the most mysterious message in the universe. Uh, yeah. And apparently it's been dating back since um, 2007, so 10 years. But they've they've um, dated it, um, sorry, they've traced it back to a dwarf star galaxy. It's Red uh, Dwarf. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's probably Lister and the cat and everything. But, um, I mean, they, they seem to be saying that these uh, these mysterious messages are kind of like electronic radio bursts of some kind that aren't natural and have some kind of pattern to them. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about that or can I comment have, on that. Yeah, I would, I would say be very, very wary and give them a lot of time to analyse it. I mean, there have been numerous kind of false alarms with this sort of thing in the past that have come out over the years where, oh, wow, we've got the signal, we've got the signal, and then later on they find out it's a very unusual type of star uh, i would i would say after give them a lot of detailed analysis um after that if they did find out that it definitely was uh, an extraterrestrial signal the question is would they even release that to the public <laughs> yeah i mean as i said to someone when i saw it uh, about this this signal um a for instance you know if they're already coming here wherever they're coming from why would they bother sending a phone call as it were from a distant galaxy if they're already here anyway um and also, would they, uh, you know, radio signals are, are, are presumably an antiquated kind of uh, form of communication uh, as far as ET or whoever they are would use. Um, more often than not, we, we find in radio emissions coming out of stars, dead stars and, uh, and the edges of black holes or something like that. I mean, I'm not an astronomer, but that's the kind of understanding I, I get that radio emissions are a part of the natural universe anyway. Well, I, yes. I, I, I have to say also, sorry to interject here, but I have to say, do, don't you think it's really quite laughable that every time something like this comes um, our way into the public domain, that it's so far away that it won't affect us? It's always got to be so far away yeah. and always left mm. in a question without actually dealing with what's really going on down here at the moment. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, there, there are, uh, uh, I understand and I, I know that there is a bigger picture here with regards to a higher structured system that feeds down into the media machine, give us, the public, trivia. And, and if, the, if anyone does discover anything that in any way upsets the, the, the apple cart, they will go in for the kill, trust me. So I, I don't buy all that. I mean, it may be true, but that doesn't help us here at this moment in time dealing with UFO subject matter, which is plaguing our world every day to this hmm. day. Mm. Uh, the way I kind of picture this, the more I read about it, the more I kind of form a kind of a, a whole kind of world view of it. Uh, I kind of make the analogy that if you think that you're, uh, say, a gamekeeper looking after a national park in Africa or something, you've got all your different creatures there. And periodically, you've got to travel out to the far edges of this thousand acre you know, national park to check on your your giraffes or your elephants and things like that and obviously now and again you've you've got to maybe check on the blood for the giraffe uh, so you kind of put it to sleep and you you know you take samples etc etc or you're going to artificially inseminate a creature because its breeding is not correct etc etc um from the point of view of the giraffe or the whatever it is that's being brought down they see these strange things come down and mm-hmm. they're running for their lives and then they're suddenly put to sleep and then they wake up and they have no recollection or very little recollection of what's happened to them but periodically they see these strange creatures coming down with machines and things like that uh, it must be a very strange experience for them and this is the way i kind of equate it to to us humans with with the ufo world um the fact that we're monitored um these strangers come down do things to us it's almost as if we're part of this national park in our part of the galaxy i would agree absolutely yeah um and and then you, know, you go back millions of years they're talking about that you know supposedly ufos have been around for a long long time and so we, we've been looked after or monitored or controlled for a long long time on this outer rim of the, the you know the, the milky way or whatever it is um 
Uh, and going back to the crash retrieval things, another thing that's occurred to me that obviously if these UFOs have been coming around for a long time, um, obviously before we ever had our military to bring them down, they must have come a cropper now and again in the long distant past over Earth's history. Yep. So my supposition is that there possibly could be ancient crashed craft somewhere out there that not even the military has found yet, hidden in jungles or buried under earth or something like that in the same way that archaeologists find things that shouldn't be there absolutely it's a, it, i mean we've got that the baltic sea anomaly which is interesting yeah. and hasn't been discussed in the news for quite a while um that all went very quiet what what was going on with that very interesting that uh, what i mean i, I recall it vaguely uh, can you go yeah. over the details of that day yeah they um they did a scan of the uh, the the seabed and found this Odd, odd shaped kind of roundish object. Some people have, uh, said it looked a bit like the Millennium Vulcan. Yes, I remember <laughs> um, it. Yeah, yeah. And they took cameras down, and there's definite kind of edges, you know, that look like steps. There's kind of round holes that look like they're chiselled. Now, it appeared to be made out of stone. Yeah, but they did say that there was um, very strange radio signals. Now, this could just be rumours. This could be an urban legend uh, that's been built up around it. But the uh, the people who were out there on the boats said it was interfering with their radio equipment on the boats. Now, uh, and then there's other claims that the military moved in and cordoned off the area. Now, some of these could just be internet claims, and that's the problem: is that we deal with it. we're dealing with an age where there's all sorts of internet rumours going around, and it does muddy the waters, especially regarding the UFO subject. I would say to anybody out there, um, you know, check the kind of background credentials of researchers that you're looking into um, and 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 trust people who you believe are, you know, who are giving the real information. I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I certainly the cases that I put out are exactly as I've heard them off the individuals and they can be interpreted in different ways. But I'm not trying to cover anything up at all. You know, I just pass it on to the public. But um, there's a lot of people out there who are elaborating or completely fabricating stories. And you get that going on all the time. And unfortunately, it does sort of tend to ridicule the UFO subject. And a lot of people don't realize that there's this deep truth behind all that. Mm. Now, um we're hearing a lot of people talking about the fact that when they do try and get these this information out, uh, that there's uh, people that uh, are being pursued by the authorities mm -hmm. and, and the word targeted individuals has been used a lot. Has, has anyone come across that? Yes. Um, yeah, we had an incident go on with, um, with, uh, with my group um, where it, it appears that my group has been monitored. Uh, I was working with a uh, contactee from, uh, from, from up north uh, in Yorkshire and um, he hadn't told anybody uh, at all that um, that he was working with me on, on his experiences. We were just discussing things over the phone, and we met up a couple of times uh, to, to go over his case. And uh, he went out to a market, and while he was out at the market, uh, a, a, a random individual tapped him on the shoulder, and he turns around, and there's a, uh, there's a guy in a brown suit, so men in brown, I don't know. Um, and <laughs> and he, he says to him this, he says, uh, you know that person you're talking to in Birmingham, uh, how do you know you can really trust him? And then, and then he turns around and just walks out of there, and the, the man involved uh, sees him get into this car and just drive off. Uh, he rings me up almost straight away after this has happened. He, you know, tells Dave, "You're not going to believe what's just happened." He's got no reason to make up that story, and I, I believe that um, they were monitoring the fact that I was dealing with this case, and for whatever reason, didn't want aspects of it getting out into the public domain. Now, really? out of interest, this person where this where this happened to, did they have anything along the lines of black helicopters around the house? Oh yeah, they've had all sorts of stuff going like that. Yeah, there's been there's been other. Uh, other surveillance and everything involved mm. in that case. Um, yeah, but I mean that 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 there was proof to me that that my group, Birmingham UFO Group, is being monitored. But I've believed that for a long time that UFO groups around the UK are are monitored. Uh, I remember many many years ago at, at a conference seeing a uh, transcript of a UFO uh, TV program, and at the top of it, and this is real. It was it was straight up document, the real deal. And at the top of it was a list of addresses of where this transcript had been sent to. And on that list was uh, our parliament, uh, the White House, uh, the Pentagon, the MOD, the CIA, and, uh, and, and a number of other companies. Nobody had a clue what, what they were. It was just unknown names of organizations. Now, why on earth would the Pentagon and the White House be interested in a UK-based program on the subject of UFOs if there's nothing in it? Mm, Ask yourself that. Yeah? 
And Philip, when you uh, was researching Rendlesham for quite a while, you, you you were kind of being pursued a little bit there, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was in touch with John Hanson, as you know, as the author of the Haunted Sky series, and um, he was very helpful when I was um, dealing with a lot of the research to the book Sky Crash Throughout Time uh, that I was uh, co-authoring with Brenda Butler. I had a lot of her material, and um, one of the interesting characters in there was a man called David Daniels, and when I met Nick Pope again in, in in, uh, Arizona in February, we had a little chat about that. So they were very interested in this non-human entity that made his appearance after the initial Rendlesham UFO encounter. Um, when I was speaking to John Hansen over the phone, um, he John Hansen used to work for the police, so he was very much in, uh, knowing of, of phone calls, and and I'm sure that we were we were being tapped quite a lot of the times. So I, di I didn't think that there was anything they didn't know that we didn't know that was of interest to them that we were discussing, but most certainly that's the only thing that I've really come close to um, in terms of monitoring. However, my mobile phone sometimes acts very strange um, on occasions, and, and also that when I was linked with Beams, the British Earth and Air and Mystery Society, and when I was uh, co-authoring um, a book with um, Kenneth John Parsons, we, we had a, an acceptance from Gateway Books many years ago, but they folded. Um, but our conversations were being, I'm sure, infiltrated by unknown sources. So it's a regular thing. And even Beams was being monitored. So Dave, you say about your group being monitored, it wouldn't surprise me at all. They go in, they see who's about. And more times than not, um, they're just there to see what you to, to see and hear what you know and what you've experienced along with the other people. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're obviously cataloguing all of the groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you had the black helicopters yourself? I ask because I know somebody who's highly psychic themselves. They've had weird incidents, and we might get them on the show. She's quite willing to. And um, one of the, the major things she has is the helicopters. Now, I've seen them because she lives a mile away from me, and I kid you not, I can see them from my house hovering over hers, and I'll text her, and she'll say, yeah, they're back again. Uh, well, do you know who they are, what they are, what they want? What's, what's the deal with the helicopters? Well, I mean, the helicopters, the only time that I really experienced those was when we were researching in Mendelssohn Forest and uh, in late into the night, early morning. And on one occasion, when we were out there, there was um, one of them, a huge black helicopter. Um, and it was trying to, it was, a, it was basically annoying us because it kept hovering so low to where we were. We, the, we were the only ones in the forest. And it wanted, it wanted us out. So we decided to go back to the car and when we went back to the car, Susan's car, my brother and myself, there were tire tracks around the vehicle and you could see they were fresh. So we drove down um, away from the base and, and around a little corner. So we hit the car and then the helicopter disappeared and we crawled back up to where the gates are uh, that lead down towards the gates of, of um, uh, Eastgate. And, and all of a sudden there was a huge convoy of these military vehicles coming up the road. So I and Susan hid behind this bark of tree. And by the way, I was wearing a cream colored jumper. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> trying to hide behind this huge bark of tree, we must have looked absolutely ridiculous. But these vehicles were, the windows were blacked out. I don't know who they were carrying, what they were carrying. I'm not sensationalizing this story, but uh, for a disused base, they'd gone into the base. You could see them going into the base and all in uniform, um, the way that they were driving very slowly. And, and that was uh, one occasion. There was another occasion where we were hassled by um, a, a helicopter and it, it wanted us out, but we saw uh, a, a flash of a UFO that was coming behind the actual uh, helicopter and we were trying to point because the helicopter was so low on the ground in front of us facing us we were trying to point to the pilots to say look it what so there's something happening behind you they weren't interested uh, they were more interested in in seeing what we were doing and that was very bizarre um you know when i think back to those occasions they seem very strange and uh you know, but no harm came. I don't think they'd harm us in any way at all. I, I, I really don't know what their take was on that. We were just three, you know, people in the forest doing our own bits and pieces. We weren't, you know, holding up the military establishment or anything. <laughs> um, Dave, um, I was Hello. reading through your notes as well that you sent me. Uh, thank you for that. And, and you've got lots of points that you've made there. And, and one of them is that... Uh, uh, you know, who are they um, and where are they from? Can mm -hmm. you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of theories, isn't there? And uh, obviously one of the most common theories is that they are extraterrestrial in origin. Um, 
And I, I think, given the evidence that I've seen over the years and things the beings have said to contactees directly, uh, I would say that that's probably the most likely explanation. There have been some cases where they've actually mentioned particular star systems that they're from. Uh, one of the other theories about their origin is that they are extra-dimensional, not extraterrestrial. Uh, I believe it's probably a mix of both, because these beings seem to show very, very unusual multidimensional characteristics, especially involved with contact, uh, taking people through solid objects, that sort of thing, appearing out of nowhere or out of bright light uh, into the into the vicinity. Um, so I, I think that they're probably extraterrestrial with extra-dimensional uh, capabilities, uh, but they can, of course, be very vulnerable and fragile and very physical as well, uh, as seen with the uh, UFO crashes, uh, such as Roswell, which I absolutely believe was a uh, crash of a you know of a disc with uh, with its occupants. Um, so you know they they can be they can come into our sort of physical reality. Uh, there are other there are other po possibilities put forward, uh, which some some have got more evidence to back them up than others. Some people believe maybe they're time travelers that are sent, uh, you know, back from our future. So these beings are. are you know, as something that we've created to, to come back to harvest genetic material. Um, other, other people believe that maybe there's some sort of military project, you know, that these things are kind of grown in labs for whatever reason and are controlled by uh, unknown human groups. Um, and there's other theories that uh, maybe they're a species that have always been here and lived on the earth alongside humankind since the, since the beginning and for whatever reason have taken a kind of back step and let us become the, uh, the dominant species on the planet. Now, so, uh, now, Philip, um, you you have, um, I believe, some experience of of actually meeting some of these beings or being abducted by some of these beings. Do you want to um, go into that at all? Yes, I mean, uh, in the winter of 1989, uh, in the village that we lived in, um, I had an experience that was very traumatic and uh, very difficult. Was very difficult for me to come to terms with uh, because um, it it did involve uh, a lot of um, controversy in terms of. You know, you hear people getting raped, yeah? And I think when you're dealing with this type of subject, or with them as they call, call it, um, it's very, very chilling. Um, and I did have physical marks left after the encounter, um, and, and it is a little bit long-winded uh, to go into. But yes, I, I had, had an experience, and I, I dreaded to call it an abduction, but that appears to be what it was. Um, in terms of, of what they are, um, what they represent... Um, they, we have to look at the facts. The facts is that they are that they cannot reproduce, uh, that they are trying to understand us from our level and an emotional level. And they, it could well be that they, it's us from the future coming back to try and recreate, uh, recorrect something that's gone wrong in terms of reproduction. I mean, after all, um, if we take this belief a little bit step further, um, we, we're, we're under the understanding that we reincarnate and incarnate and that we are connected to a source. I mean, this, this is the whole thing we have to look at because if, if, if our life is just a mere speck and then we die, what's the point? Mm -hmm. So there is obviously a bigger, bigger, much bigger question with regards to what these entities want. They obviously want something because they're here now in our time doing what they're doing. So, what, what did the entities look like that you actually encountered? Well, it was a grey, but it was more cream-coloured than an actual grey. There was one of them, and there were three reptil what I thought were reptilians, or they looked like, behind steam, uh, when I was um, taken on board what I assume was a craft. Um, I was laid on a, a clinical bed. It was very hot in there, and I was naked. I I'm not going to go into detail here, because it was embarrassing um, with regards to the um, implementation of a device. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I can talk more about that. Um, in, in, terms of the, in terms of the reptile beings, a lot of people talk mm. about kind of these reptilian beings. Could you describe a bit more um, in yeah. detail? I mean, were they humanoid, for instance? Well, they were, they, were, they were very humanoid, but they were very tall, and they, I could see only partial bits of them because the steam was so thick and they had um, they were of the, the normal reptilian if it was in human form but they were a lot taller darker and they they were swaying from side to side um, as, as they were doing what they were doing to me um, and they held no emotion no you know even though I was under extreme stress during the situation uh, it was as though I was just a piece of meat on on a slab um, but there was one grey um, on board that craft, I assume was a craft, 
um, that that uh, that was able to communicate with me and afterwards was able to retract the device from where it had been inserted and ordered me to dress. That's and interesting. That, so that, he, th- yeah. So you say he retracted a device. So do you think he was going against orders? Do you think it was a case of kind of like the scientist releasing the guinea pig um, behind the scenes kind of thing? Well, the way that I felt and the way that the situation was, I was very grateful for them. I, I couldn't answer that question. I don't know. Mm. Um, through empathy, I don't feel so. I think what they've done is they've done. I mean, I'm, I, I remembered also um, that goes into the second part of the encounter when I was uh, asked to leave the craft and quite shocked to find that I, a, a door had opened inside and I, I saw myself at great height at the village. And it was morning, so some time had passed because I was taken at night. And that's where Neil, the uh, the other being I saw, remember I said to you about the naughty type yes, yeah. character waiting there that was very angry and uh, and as I said these these things are very I, I haven't um, I haven't added or subtracted I've only re- recounted what I recall and I had a triangular mark that was inset behind the the right my right ear that my brother tried to take a Polaroid <laughs> picture of that that didn't come out. I couldn't walk very well for a while, and I have three marks on my right arm that burn, or they, they, they come up as burn sometimes, so I don't know what that's all about. But, you know, I got past that point. During that time, there was hardly anyone I could talk to. Jenny Randalls, I, I did have a call from Jenny Randalls. I was in touch with her for a, a short while. She was seen, seemed to be fascinated by the instant, although, um, and and basically at that many people that you could reach out to not like today where you have support groups and people who could understand you and I and I think I've grown from that experience I think I've made it was something that I still to this day can see as clearly as, as day mm. oh, oh, and just very briefly because it's almost time to wrap up briefly your understanding of why they're doing it was any of that communicated to you or do you have any inklings about no that? no not then not not during them, I, I, I had a flash of uh, inspiration in 1996 when, um, when I was trying to understand what, how they were doing what they were doing, and of course that came out as an article um, in a, in, in, in a UFO magazine, quite a big one called Spirits in the Material World, and that dealt with the aspects of, of incarnation, reincarnation, soul level, and cloning, and, and that all came to me. I, 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 I can't credit myself to having that. Because because it felt like I was being given it by something else, or some something else gave it to me, mm. and I and I, I I built upon the model of that that theoretical idea and, and moved it forward. So, did it help me? Did the experience help me? Perhaps in some ways. Was it her- horrific? Yes, it was. It was totally horrific. Um, and you know, I remember talking about this many many years ago, and and to an amused crowd. And of course, I withdrew because. At that time, I didn't feel that it was right about what actually had happened. Um, but I'm, I'm more interested in the research and, and, and that side of it than, than my own encounter. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I still haven't come to terms with what quite hap- happened or why it happened. Well, as always, um, unfortunately, time has um, caught up with this, so to speak. But we'd love to have you both, um, Dave and um, Philip, back on the show. So if, if you're around in the future... Uh, would you come on for a second or third instalment? Absolutely, yeah. No problem at all. Fantastic. Brilliant. And just oh, quickly, yes. Philip, Philip and uh, Dave, indeed. if you want to just give me your, um, or give the listeners your either websites or how they can contact you or any books that um, you've got um, going on at the moment. Sure thing. Uh, sh- shall I go first, Philip? Yeah. Um, you go ahead. Philip. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, my, my website for the group is um, boofog.com. The ufog.com and uh, on there you can find details of our upcoming meetings we hold monthly meetings in Albury, north birmingham um anybody's welcome not just group members um so come along you can hear speakers uh see documentaries all sorts of things real nice little community we've got um and also all the case reports of the cases i've investigated over the last nine uh, nine years are, are on there hundreds of case reports for you to read through and lots of other information uh we also have a facebook page um Birmingham UFO group uh, uh, just type that in and it'll come up that's our organisation page and we've also got a uh, Facebook community page where we uh, do a lot of chat and post video links and that and that's uh, Boofog Truth Seekers uh, so if you search for that uh, on Facebook uh, if you use that um, yeah get involved and uh, join join the group and hope to hear from you soon Fantastic, Philip 
Um, yeah, I mean, you just put the internet, Philip Kinsella UFO or Philip Kinsella Psychic or whatever, you can get hold of me there. Um, I'm also the author of um, a few books on UFOs and psychic. I'm working on a board, um, A Passage Through Eternity. Um, that I'm, I'm, I've got five chapters left to do, and I've got a, um, a researcher who's going to do the foreword for me on that one. I have a book already with, with my publishers called You, the Public Deceived, so I'm still waiting for a green light from that. The other books, um, uh, the, the, the other books that I've written is uh, Sky Crash Throughout Time, um, Believe, Bridging the Gap Between the Psychic and UFO Phenomenon, and also Reaching for the Divine, so, as well as children's books and science fiction, but those are the main books on the paranormal. So, yeah. That's, uh, I'm, I'm busy working on some other projects after that. Thank you. Are you available for private readings as well, if people are interested? <laughs> yeah, I'm booked up until February oh, okay. <laughs> at the moment. So I'm, I'm, uh, my niece, Charlie, she deals with all of that. Bless her. She, she sorts it all out for me. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Dave and Philip and for taking part it's been a very very interesting evening and um unfortunately as andy says we've run out of time now so uh it's been great though to take a peep into the paranormal world of ufos and i'm sure it's something we can come back and take even further deeper peeps and find out more information so uh, if any of listeners want to know more go to dave hodrian's uh website or philip kinsella's website and uh, you can find out more about their information of what's coming up and i'm actually due to appear at the uh Berman ufo group i believe it's um march isn't it dave yes yeah did we, yes. Did we set a date on that we haven't yet no we no. will do soon though <laughs> i will be talking not on ufos i'll be talking on encounters with fairies ghosts and spirits but i will do a slight crossover into the world of ufos as well okay i think that's a wrap for tonight's show and it's been a very interesting first show to start 2017 off with any final words andy before we go um yeah just that i'm uh, currently redesigning my website www um tuned in events.co.uk so that's tuned with a d in events.co.uk and hopefully i'm going to be doing a few more um events and things coming up so keep a, an eye out on that okay well thank you very much indeed gentlemen and it's a good night from myself and good night from myself thank you very much yes thank you gentlemen thank you very much and uh thank you for having me on your show with all these these good people thanks thank you, yeah. thank you. all right and we'd like to wish everybody a wonderful and happy new year good night all thank you good night good night night You was listening to The Paranormal Peep Show with Andy Chaplin and Neil Geddes-Ward on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. <laughs>